the trade unions were organized as a response to the, the stockholding companies of the first and second industrial revolutions, as were the cooperatives. But they always had to play a catch-up game. Because in the first and second industrial revolution, it was, they were based on centralized communications, centralized ener energies, and centralized transport. This required massive capital. So we had to create the modern stockholding company to get capital from small players all over the world. But then to get a return on investment to all those stockholders, they had to create vertically integrated giant companies that could create economies of scale to return that massive investment. And so they had the edge up. Labor unions came in to organize for their rights, uh, to, to suggest that they, they are an intimate part of the means of production and need to be fairly treated. Cooperatives came in also as an alternative to be able to organize on an alternative frame, but they were always playing catch up because it required vertical integration to create these forms. But cooperatives hung in there and they, and they became a minor success story. But in the third industrial revolution, the platform favors cooperatives and trade unions because it's designed, the architecture of the platform is not centralized, it's distributed. It's not top down, it's collaborative. It's not proprietary with intellectual property. It's designed to be open and transparent. That's how you benefit. And it doesn't vertically scale, it laterally scales. And anyone that's been in a network, the more you build the network laterally, the more everyone benefits from everyone's talents and it comes back to everyone. Think Wikipedia, all right? Nonprofit, education in the world. So what I'm saying is the unions uh, various, uh, the union's philosophy is, is correct. We ought to be able to share the fruits of our production and distribution in the world. But they're, they're still in a second industrial revolution frame. The trade and the cooperatives uh, as, a, as a young sister to the bigger guys in the market. They both have to reorganize for a digital generation that's laterally scaled. And that means they have to begin to, to bring in the millennials, the digital generation, have a little reverse mentoring and they began to recruit them. Now, let me say where, where the unions can, can be very a powerful force. While the millennials are open to the sharing economy, uh, they're open to producing lots of goods and service for each other free beyond the market, uh, from each according to the ability to each according to their need. Across these networks, they're doing it. On the other hand, they have not realized that this is a struggle because it isn't gonna be a cakewalk. There are some companies that are forming in platforms, they're creating the new monopolies, the Googles, the, the Facebooks, the Twitters, it allows millions of others then to create sharing economies, which disrupt under industries, but some companies rise to the top. But remember, remember there's Wikipedia. That's nonprofit. There's Couchsurfing. That's nonprofit for sharing apartments. Organize. Right now, as my wife says, the millennials uh, uh, have not yet realized you can't just click an app to make your choice. That's important. And you can organize in the internet. And virtual organizing is essential. But you have to be on the ground, too. You have to be in the communities. You have to be at the table. You have to bear witness. You have to make the struggle. This is a struggle. Will this be power to the people? Well, maybe. Will it go to the top? I guardedly think it won't. You know why? The technology is so distributed, if you try to monopolize it, you can't actually succeed. Here's where the unions come in and the cooperatives. There's wisdom. There's experience. There's, there's decades of struggle. And we, you have to say the millennials, we we need to pass on the wisdom and experience. We have to change the game, change the rules, change the strategies. But the basic premise is that we, we only succeed to the extent that we can organize collectively in order to be able to have some control over our production and our distribution. That's the history of the labor movement. That's the history of cooperatives. So there's a deep history. And that, the millennials need to know that history. They got to organize to have some control over their production and distribution in these networks in the third industrial revolution. The millennials can share their knowledge with the older generation because they know how to digitally connect. They have helped create the sharing economy. They're producing goods and services for each other at lower marginal cost. It's a perfect marriage, but it has to begin now. The disruptions of the third industrial revolution are really beyond anything we've seen in a short period of time. This is as disruptive as the shift from agriculture to the industrial age, but it's a shorter period. I can tell you that corporate boardrooms are in complete disarray trying to figure out what to do about a zero marginal cost society. But they're at least a little bit ahead of the labor unions and cooperatives that are not really at the table yet. And they're recruiting millennials or buying them into their system. But this, this infrastructure, this third industrial revolution, it favors cooperatives. We'd have to reinvent them. What's happened with energy? You could have said, well, the big companies will control all the solar and wind. They lost in 10 years in Germany, in Denmark. Because the system was designed to be distributed, 
So all these small players created cooperatives and they got a low interest loan from the banks, farmer groups, little SMEs, neighborhood groups. They're producing all the energy in Germany. The big power companies are out of the game because they're, they can do vertical integration of centralized energies, but these energies have to be collected everywhere. The sun, the wind, the heat. It requires cooperatives. They've already won. Cooperatives around the world will be producing the energy locally and sharing it and selling it back. The energy power companies may help run the grid, but this is power to the people. This is not going to go away. So when you take these two examples, if you can be able to see power distributed and everybody produces it locally and shares it, and music and news and knowledge, this can happen in many other fields. This is reality. This isn't a theory. This is happening. So we need to see cooperatives and the unions reinventing themselves, but not losing the philosophical edge, the drive, the motivation, which is to share the fruits of our labor, to produce and share and work with each other. Help move the sharing economy, help promote it, help ensure that we can create cooperatives and laterally scaled institutions to be able to produce and share the way we communicate, the way we produce energy, the way we share transport, the way we make things. And if we don't do this revolution, then um, we have no one to blame but ourselves. So I think this is the moment. I think we need to, to have the labor movement come to the floor, the cooperatives come together, reinvent ourselves, and begin to take an active role in dealing with the political implications of how we create a more just, humane, and more democratic form of the economy to live in. And so we can actually create a sustainable way to be on this planet as well. And it should be done today.